Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Colleen Wessel McCoy, and I'm part of Cairo's the Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary, and I'm moderating today's panel. Uh, that's a celebration of uh, Bachley and Peggy Terry, and um, thinking about the original Rainbow Coalition. I want to make a note before we begin that we're recording this session, and it'll be available. Um, it's, uh, it's being recorded by the Open University of the Left, which comes out of Chicago. It's a, it's a long time, 30 year organization. And if you see on the board here, this is a link that will take you to the YouTube channel where today's panel will be published. Open University of the Left. Just um, Open Univ of the Left dash YouTube of the left. will get you there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Just as a word of introduction, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists today, uh, and mostly just give them time to speak and share uh, their experiences, their, their studies of this history, and their reflections on its lessons for today. We also want to make sure that we have time for conversation and questions from the audience, and particularly questions from the audience. I want to start by just a word of introduction, brief word of introduction for Bob Lee and Peggy Terry. Bob grew up in Texas and became a central leader of the Illinois Black Panthers Party alongside Chairman Fred Hampton in the late 1960s. It was Lee who was the party's field secretary uh, and began building relationships with poor white and poor Latinx Chicagoans towards building new forms of cross-race class struggle. They called their collaboration the Rainbow Coalition. We often call it the original Rainbow Coalition now in order to distinguish it from the later movement that called it uh, organization that called itself the Rainbow Coalition. But in, in terms of the original Rainbow Coalition, its key organization, in addition to the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers Party, was the Young Lords Organization, the Young Patriots Organization, and Rising Up Angry. Bob Lee died this, just this past March. Peggy Terry was a Southern white migrant worker raised in a segregationist family in Kentucky alongside waitressing and raising three children in the white slums of Chicago's uptown neighborhood, she came to volunteer with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and later Jobs or Income Now, often called JOIN. She organized and developed generations of activists, and she died in 2004. Both Lee and Terry held together the inseparable fight against capitalism and white supremacy in ways that we often fail to fully grasp today. They both developed strategic understandings of who we're up against and who must then unite to transform society, the poor and dispossessed across race. And then they organized with others to put that strategy into motion, including the original Rainbow Coalition. The leadership and organizations with, with, with which they organized were politically assassinated and their history repressed. To the extent that this history continues to be repressed, our organizing today is crippled. We fight with an arm tied behind our back and that limitation of historical knowledge, knowledge is not accidental. But the panelists before you are, in my estimation, heroes. They represent a multi-front effort to reignite the strategic assessment of the leadership of the original Rainbow Coalition. They bring the resources of historical perspective, grassroots experience, and scholarship. So I'm excited and honored to be introducing them today. Um, I'll start. I'll move from, from the right and move leftward. No, I'll start with the left. No, I'll start at the right and move leftward. <laughs> start at the right and move leftward. Stay well. My no, first don't instinct don't is the right one here. Don't go so. back, stay well. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Asantua Nkuma Toure is a longtime community organizer and radical pan Africanist political activist and has worked on various social justice campaigns such as violence against women, immigrant and worker human rights the human rights of incarcerated LGBTQ people, Occupy Wall Street, Palestine solidarity and anti-Zionism, Christian liberation theology, and more. She currently lives and organizes in Philadelphia, where she is a member of Women of Color, Global Women's Strike, and the Green Party of Philadelphia. Melody James was a member of the Jobs or Income Now Community Union and created its successful joint theater. She continued in California to work at the intersection of theater and social change, and was a 12-year member of the San Francisco Mind Troop. Kai Thurman was a member of the Young Patriots organization, and continues today to organize the revival of, of Young Patriots chapters across the U.S. to fight the disunity of the poor across racial lines, including where he lives now in Alabama. 
James Tracy is an author and activist based in San Francisco, engaged on a range of fronts, including housing, labor, education. He co-authored Hillbilly Nationalist, Urban Race Rebels, and Black Power, Community Organizing and Radical Time. And then Jacoby Williams is a professor at Indiana University, Bloomington. His most recent book is From the Bullet to the Ballot, the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers Party and Racial Coalition Politics in Chicago. The breadth and depth of work represented in this panel to make the legacies and lessons of Lee, Terry, and the movement they led is essential if we take seriously the call to transform the world through understanding it clearly and soberly. So welcome and thank you to all the panelists. Um, so I'm going to um, really want you all to take time to share the lessons that you bring to this, tell us a little bit more about yourself, how you came to this subject, uh, or how you came to this, this form of organizing, your history, um, and then the lessons for today. And so I want to give each of you really a block of time to get into that a little more, and then have some conversations among you, and then open it up to questions from, from everyone that's here. Um, I want to start, um, start with uh, Professor Williams. Would you be willing to start? Um, okay, I suppose so. Um, so you don't want me to talk about Bob Lee much? Just I, I really, Bob, really, really, it was an emphasis on Bob Lee um, and Peggy Terry. Okay. Um, so what I have planned to do, um, I can tell you a little bit about myself, I guess, and then I plan to read some excerpts um, from an obituary or memorial that I wrote about Bob Lee once he passed. Some of you may have read it, so you might not want to hear it. Uh, and maybe start there and see what happens next. Um, I, I am born and raised on the south side of Chicago. I'm from Inglewood. For those of you who don't know Inglewood, most of you see WGN or National by Chicago in Blackman. That's where, that's where I'm from. Um, I, I often tell folks I'm an activist scholar. Folks and most people in the academy um, shy away from those kinds of terms. My, my, my colleagues at IU don't see me often. I've been there five years now, maybe six, I can't remember. Um, I think I've been on campus three, maybe four semesters total, because I'm hardly ever there because the work is in the street now on campus. Um, I often tell them I like my job, I do, I do my job pretty well, but that's quite it, it's my job, it's not who I am. But most of us get to be doctors and PhDs and then those titles become us. Uh, about the folks who we study. I write books about them, we study them, we get tenure, but we don't get involved with them. And so I don't subscribe to that kind of thinking. Uh, Bob Lee is an epitome of uh, that kind of um, activist who I strive to be. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not a season of meeting people um, on this esteemed panel. I have a lot to learn. Uh, with that said, um, I dive right in to tell you a little bit about Bob Lee, that's okay. All right, so um, I, I wrote this, I think it came out a couple of days, maybe a week after he passed away. Um, it was published in two places. The last place was on the Jacobin Online, not in the magazine, but the online version. Uh, Bob Lee died on Tuesday, uh, March, uh, March 12th, 21st, I'm sorry, uh, 2017, um, after a battle with cancer. But we, we people don't know, he also had multiple sclerosis. He was already confined to a wheelchair, and I say a little bit about that. Um, I last saw Bob Lee less than two weeks before his death in the hospital room in Houston, Texas. Uh, still the consummate organizer. He was trying to organize the hospital's nurses and dining staff uh, from the confines of his hospital bed. Uh, and as I watched his efforts in amazement, it reminded me that one should never pass up an opportunity to organize those in need, even uh, in the state that he was in. Um, I could tell you a little bit about his background. Um, he's Houston, Texas, born in December of 42, uh, to Robert and Selma Robert Lee. His name is actually Robert E. Lee III. Uh, no, it's not named after the Confederate general. Uh, it just happened to be a coincidence named after his grandfather, who was an activist in the Longshore Missouri, much of which where he got a lot of his activist uh, spirit from. Uh, his mother had a nightclub, and a lot of the activists and Longshore Miss activists as well frequent those clubs. So as he argued, he grew up in activism. Uh, he eventually moved to Chicago to become a list of volunteer um, in 1968, uh, Volunteers in Service for, for America. Um, he was stationed on the north side of Chicago. For those who are not familiar with Chicago, Chicago then, and still is today, the 
the most racially, residentially segregated city in America. For his works with his census record. Uh, so he's situated on the north side, which is primarily where most uh, white Americans or white residents live. But there's also some Puerto Ricans up there. Uh, there's very few African Americans, if any, um, and mostly immigrants who uh, migrate to that side of town. Um, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, he looked to join the Black Panther Party like a lot of people did. Um, so he joined the Illinois chapter of the party. Um, he was already organizing uh, uptown on the north side of uh, Chicago. And Fred Hampton, because of his activist spirit, uh, labeled him a field secretary, which is not an easy job to get in the Black Panther Party at that time. You really have to know organizing to get that position. Um, so he, he, and he situated them on the north side, which again was for the Black Panther Party, it's odd. There's no black people on the north side, but that's where he situated him. Um, he began to work with Hyde Thurman and a couple other folks, uh, and a couple other uh, members of the Young Patriots and so forth in uptime. Uh, he and Fred Hampton used to meet indirectly, uh, or I should say in, in secret in the beginning, um, because there were members of the Black Panther Party who just were not keen to organizing with Southern whites, working class whites, um, mainly because of the Northern Confederate flag. Uh, and folks uh, just didn't want to get in tune with that. And so Fred Hampton and, and Bob Lee uh, were the only two people privy to what was going on in terms of being in the organization, the party was going on, until he was actually able to forge that bond with the, with the organization. And then he brought them into uh, the coalition with the Black Panther Party. So many of those members of the Illinois chapter who just couldn't get over the racial, with what Fred Hampton would say the racial thing, he purged them out of the party. Uh, because the movement was more important than the so-called racial divides. Uh, and so Bob Lee was, was crucial to that. Uh, I can say a little bit about how they met, but I think Hyde might talk about that, uh, the, the Church of Three Crosses and so forth. Uh, let's see. Black Panther Party, the White Proyo's introduction, class solidarity, the organized young patriots and the Panthers in this ideology that transcends race. Um, together, the Panthers, the Young Patriots, and also the Young Lords went to Park to help perform um, this uptown coalition of poor people. And this community coalition, United Residents, and its owners, that they now, but we all now identify as some Lords. Um, and so the, the original Rainbow Coalition were um, the Young Patriots, that's what Bob brought to the fold, uh, the Young Lords, Young Lords Organization, um, Puerto Rican youth in Chicago, is where the Young Lords started for those who want to live. <coughs> Uh, you get the Young Lords party in New York, but the Young Lords began in Chicago and then migrated uh, to the, the East Coast and became a larger of its own phenomenon as the Young Lords party here in New York. So the Young Lords became the second group. And then uh, together they made, this, these three groups made the original Rainbow Coalition. So Bob Lee was crucial to bring in the Young Patriots and Southern Whites to the fold. And Fred Hampton was crucial to bring in Puerto Ricans and other Latinos to the fold. And they made up the original Rainbow Coalition. But it was short lived, uh, especially after Fred Hampton died in 1969, or well, more accurately assassinated in 19, December 1969. It lived, but the, the tenants lived on in a number of ways. So there was no real quote unquote leader of this Rainbow Coalition. They worked in as an uh, equal head, but due to charismatic like leadership of Fred Hampton, you know, he often dubbed as the de facto leader of this group. Even though there was no real leader, they all worked and learned from one another in all the various ways. Um, but then after his assassination, it was people like Tasha Jimenez, uh, the young girls who really kept the Rainbow Coalition and this kind of racial coalition spirit alive. Um, even the young patriots themselves were short lived. And but that kind of white working class solidarity continued with the intercommunal intercommunal survival community. Um, and that group will evolve into another conglomerate. Uh, and, and that group will be the ones who are uh, equally important in fostering the, the, the rise of the first black mayor of Chicago, Carol Washington, who, as a Democrat, runs on the Rainbow Coalition ticket. So these groups that ran up the original Rainbow Coalition, they organized his campaign, got out to vote for his campaign, and ran his campaign. In fact, Chacha Jimenez was the North Side captain for his campaign. And when he became mayor of Chicago in 1983, he created what he called his Rainbow Capital. And for the first time in Chicago history, poor whites, Latinos, African Americans, even people with disabilities had power in the city of Chicago. It's just a real way of 
uh, the freedom is kind of the same politics. And so the Rainbow Coalition was, was crucial to that, and Bob Lee was also crucial to that as well. I said a little bit about Bob Lee as an organizer, but I may have gone over my 10 minutes by now, I'm not sure, I'm long-winded. Um, when I first met Bob Lee, uh, again, he was in a wheelchair, muscle sclerosis. Nevertheless, he drove me around the Crip Ward, where he was known as the mayor uh, of the Crip Ward. Uh, this elderly African-American woman flagged down our car, and we pulled over. She told Lee that she needed a pair of shoes. And taking care to mention her shoe size, Lee told her he would find her a pair. Um, a few blocks later, an older African-American gentleman asked her to have his lawn cut. Shortly thereafter, we just pulled up on this guy who was walking down the street. Bob didn't know him. He just, he just pulled up and told the guy he loved him, that he needed anything. The guy told us he hadn't eaten in a week. Uh, next thing we did was um, we, we drove from there. A few hours later, we ended up getting this lawnmower. I put it in the back of his, his truck, his car. Uh, he made a stop at his community center and picked up a fair, pair of shoes for this woman. Uh, got a three or four pair, actually. The young man who needed food ended up mowing the older gentleman's lawn, or the morning's lawn. And then he met us later at the elderly woman's house, and we all ate heartily. This, this big meal that she had prepared, along with some barbecue that, that uh, Bob Lee was able to get the people he knew in the community. And so then we all sat down and ate heartily. Everyone he helped that day uh, assured Lee that he would get out, they would all get out and vote for Franco Lee using the 1010 uh, phenomenon, meaning you go tell 10 people, register 10 people, have them tell 10, and so forth and so on. Um, and then this is how he operated, right? He, he was able to get all the candidates that he supported uh, in, in in his precinct, uh, any candidate he supported, all of one. He, he, he was betting a thousand. Um, it's not by accident when Obama finally decided he was going to run for president, the first office he opened uh, in the community it was not Chicago, it was right in the Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas. Because uh, he understood the way it was his coalition was powerful as well. Um, I end here because uh, I could go on and on, and I don't want to get the sand out. Um, I would say that as a, it was it was activists like Bob Lee uh, who was able to unite people across these deep, what we see as deep seated racial differences, especially folks like the Young Patriots uh, in the late 1960s, right? So if you can do that then, then we have no excuse not to equal if not eclipse um, success in our current polarized context. And then speaking as a historian, I see no need to reinvent the wheel in order to address, I don't want to say his name, so I'm going to call it orangeism today. Uh, it was activists like me and his fellow Black Panthers and the Young Patriots and other others and who made up the original Rainbow Coalition. We created a change in our nation by daring to enter these distant neighborhoods and forge alliances. It is through the continuing nuances of applying the methods of the past to the grassroots tenets of today, including social media, databases, digital archives, algorithms, and so on, uh, to the streams of our movement's polar opposites uh, will be connected to establish a conduit of understanding, communication, and respect. And as a political symbol, the rainbow didn't refer just to a series of colors. I want to be clear about that. It signified an arc of connection between different places and different people and a way of transcending those so-called differences to find commonalities. And for Bob Lee and others who participated with him and struggled, this was the only possible starting point that they believe for revolutionary solidarity. And he is the symbol of that solidarity to many of those folks here on this panel. And I'm happy to elaborate a, a whole lot more because um, I have about an eight-page article here that I wrote on him. But I gave you maybe four paragraphs on it. I have plenty more information to provide if necessary. Well, my ramblings are unclear in any particular way because I didn't provide enough historical context. Please ask the questions. And I'm going to let, I'd rather hear from them. I do this every time to see what I'm doing, but I don't know why. They want to hear from me first. I want to hear from them. So I don't want to take over any more of anyone's time. So thanks for listening. city or anything like that. 
Melody, her brother, and, and others guided me through a lot of that. Uh, and I, I just want to say thanks to Melody and the people who joined that were there that started working with some of the southern migrants uh, who actually a lot of it came from a street gang called Peacemakers. Remember that? But anyway, uh, uh, a lot of history there. But I just want to read, I, I, I want to read something here from a book that we published, uh, Young Patriots, uh, from, uh, about the uptown community, about socialism, about organizing, about migration. Uh, and this one is called Hillbilly Harlem. Uh, it says, if you travel Route 41 from Nashville to Chicago, you better know what you've done. Because there on the north side is a sight to behold. 40,000 hillbillies shivering in the cold. Just behind the Gold Coast, right next to Lakeshore Drive, is where the people from the country arrive. They find it hard going on day labor pay, but the poor old hillbilly can't have a say. From the mines of Kentucky and the farms of Tennessee, he comes to the city to save his family. But plowing ain't so easy on concrete and stone and the jails of Chicago become the hillbilly's home. You've heard of hillbilly heaven <clears throat> from singers young and old, but there's a story, there's still a story that hasn't been told of uptown Chicago and the people who survived in hillbilly Harlem through the countless tears they cried. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> this was just a part of organizing in uptown, but I, I want to do today uh, a tribute, and I just want to read some things that I that I uh, that I wrote about Bobby Lee. Uh, I was with him when he passed away. Uh, he was a friend, a mentor, a brother. You know, just a, just a great man. Uh, you know, he wasn't perfect. You know, he's like everybody else. But uh, <clears throat> he his last words. You know, part of his last words to me is he says, you know, I. I have to prepare to go now. And um, I, I asked him, I said, is there anything you would like to say to people? And he said, yeah, I just wish everybody equality and love. And that's the way he was up until the end. But here's a, a you know tribute to him that I wrote. Uh, some of you may have read, read it in uh, you know, Jacobi. Peace and love, my white panther, young patriot brother is how Bobby Lee would greet me every time that we would talk. I would respond by saying, peace and love, my Black Panther brother, because neither considered ourselves of being a former Panther or a Patriot, an identity that he held up to the end of his life. Bobby lived what he preached. He wanted peace, love, and equality for all people. I first met Bobby Lee in 1968 at the Citizens Council in Chicago in Lincoln Park. The council would invite different organizations to learn of their activities and needs. On the night that they had double scheduled the Young Patriots and the Black Panthers, when we spoke, we told the audience the Uptown was in, and Uptown was in need of funding and, fight, and to fight poverty, gang, uh, racism. We requested funds to help feed the hungry. We were met with hostility, called a dangerous gang, cut short, and was not allowed to finish our program. But Bobby Lee would not have this attitude from the group. And not missing an opportunity to organize, he explained the young patriots were only trying to take care of their neighborhood people, the same as they were trying to take care of theirs. And the only difference between them and the young patriots and the black Panthers is that they have money to enjoy freedom and that all the people are oppressed by the government, even the middle class. Also, his belief was the only difference between the poor white man and the poor black man was the color of their skin, because they were both oppressed. He would say, this was the beginning of the rainbow village. <clears throat> Bobby moved into Uptown for two weeks, living with Southern whites, eating at their table, listening to their music, drinking in their bars, and talking about John Brown, his favorite white hero. <laughs> While living in uptown, he was threatened and detained in a Chicago police car, only to be rescued by Southerners demanding successfully his release. 
it was after that encounter that he said, I knew then that these were my brothers and sisters and could be trusted. From that point, he, he communicated, communicated with leaders of the Black Panthers, Fred Hampton and Bobby Rush, the need for coalition of class struggle across racial boundaries. In unity with the young patriots and the young lords, and later on with rising up anger, it became known as the original Rainbow Coalition. Lee, Lee did not realize the far-reaching effects of the original Rainbow Coalition would be responsible in electing Harold Washington as the first mayor of Chicago. Black Panther leader Bobby Rush was elected to uh, the Congress and serves there today. And Barack Obama used the original Rainbow Coalition politics to help his rise to president of the United States. The original Rainbow Coalition and the affiliated organizations were eventually destroyed by the Chicago police and the FBI. Many organizations, including the Black Panthers, Young Lords, and Young Patriots, lost members in a conspiracy by the Chicago police and the FBI COINTELPRO to eliminate the leaders of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers, Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was murdered in his sleep by law enforcement members of the conspiracy. I had, a great, I had the great honor, although sometimes painful, of being with Bobby, his wife, Isa, and and family during his last days. When he heard that I was coming to see him, he demanded that I stay at his house so we can stay up late at night reminiscing our past and, and conspiring the future of the revolution. <laughs> he said, and I was quickly quick to agree to his wishes because he and I had known each other for 48 years and co-founders of the original Rainbow Coalition and also because he was my best friend, one of my best friends, role model and mentor. When I first visited him in the hospital, he smiled a big smile, gave me a big hug, and retreated, repeated his greeting. Peace and love, my white panther, young patriot brother. He introduced me to everyone who entered his room and gave each member of the hospital staff a rainbow coalition button and explained how important the coalition was in the past and how much it is needed today. His sickness did not deter him from organizing. By the time that I arrived, he had successfully organized the hospital staff to donate baby clothes to the field board Houston, Texas charities. <clears throat> Bobby Lee gave up to his final days. He had heard that Bobby McGinnis, co-founder of the Young Patriots and the original Rainbow Coalition, was suffering from cancer and needed a vehicle uh, to get to his chemo and doctor's appointment. He did not hesitate in asking me to drive his vehicle. My brother Bobby, uh, his wife, Isa, and I got the necessary repairs done, and I drove it to Tennessee. Bobby was moved back home in hospice care. The cancer had spread to many areas of his body, and chemo and hospitalization would be ineffective. My friend had a love for all creatures. Outside his window were several bird baths and feeders. Each day he would feed his birds and see that they had clean water to bathe in and drink. He knew all the species, but he was in particular fond of parrots that showed up one day and would return each day for their feeding. His talents were not only for birds, but for people of the fifth ward where he lived. If a resident needed shoes, we talked about that, or clothing, he would find them and deliver them to them. He was quick to cook a meal uh, for someone that was hungry. He was the lawnmower man of the neighborhood. If his neighbors were sick or too old to care for the yard, Bobby would show up unannounced and tend to landscape. While staying in his house, his neighbors would drop off bags of food and clothing for the homeless and needy. Now these people were pretty homeless. I mean, these people were pretty poor themselves, but they, they gave food and dropped it by. On one occasion, two neighbor, on another occasion, two neighborhood men would show up at an elder's, elderly couple's home and rob them of their social security money. When Bobby heard of this incident, he picked up his shotgun and confronted the two robbers. What they didn't say is the shotgun. <laughs> uh, he also had a dog named Panther that got the other one. Um, 
They were convicted of crimes and wrote letters of apology to Lee when they discovered it was he who confronted them. Uh, his house is a work of art. Uh, being an artist, every wall in his house is covered with wonderful art showcasing civil rights organizations and act activists. One wall has 31 masks, one for each one of the Black Panther members killed while ser serving the people. Other walls have pictures of members of the Young Lords, Rising Up Anger, Young Patriots, and other fallen comrades. For many years, Bobby organized in the 5th Ward of Houston. He was known as the mayor of the 5th Ward uh, because of his activities and support to his brother, El Franco, who was successfully elected to the Senate and later served terms as county commissioner who brought much needed programs to the impoverished neighborhood. A free teen clinic is one example. El, El Franco Lee passed away a year ago, a heart attack. Each day my friend would ask me to read from the Patriot publication against the picture window, which is in here. Um, he loved hearing the poems, songs, and stories written by the people of Uptown in the 60s and 70s. Several readings would bring tears to his eyes. It means a lot more when I hear it from a brother from the neighborhood, he would say. Neither could he or I hold back the tears when he asked, <coughs> when he asked about Cha-Cha uh, Manas and Henry Poise and Gaddis. Uh, let's see. They have some pages. Uh, it, was, it, is, here we go. it has been said that when an old person dies, that a library is burned to the ground. This is especially true of Bobby Lee and his knowledge of civil rights and organizing the poor and working class. I will never forget my friend, mentor and brother, after his death, Isaac and I joked that Bobby is in heaven organizing the angels. <laughs> <laughs> I have had other mentors in my days, in my years as an organizer, in which I am enormously grateful. But because of our camaraderie and struggles, he is very special. My favorite quote from Bobby is, if you want to see a change in the neighborhood, you have to be that change. And Bobby had a way of soul connecting with every poor and working class person that, that he met. So, um, you know, Bobby, I, I, I he just, I don't know. You, you run across people like that sometime in your life and you'll never forget them, but uh, he would want us to keep, keep keeping on. Uh, one of the greatest things that he, he thought happened was how Poor white people and black people form coalitions and actually work together. And I think that's much needed more now than ever with, you know, with this, uh, uh, I don't know what's going to need it. <laughs> but with our, our guy at the White House. Um, so I would think that if he was here, he would just say, you know, love and peace and all is well. since I've been to uh, a conference like this. Uh, what bubbled up right away was the word gift. And I think that came from one of my most vivid memories of Peggy was spending an evening with her alone and at the end of it she sent me home with a little pamphlet that came from the 1930s 
called On Fascism. Mm. And so that just sort of centered how I was going to think about today. So one, I just thank the people who organized this uh, for inviting me and for all of you to come and trying to, all of us I think, talk about the past in a way that helps us focus on what to do now. Um, so I thank you for the gift to reflect on my life, because I started with, I have nothing to say, but of course, the more I dusted off things, uh, sharing our experiences now more than ever is important. I, uh, I arrived in Chicago, uptown in 1966, about a month after my brother had left his, Michael James, had left his Woodrow Wilson Fellowship at Berkeley, had gotten busted at the free speech movement and started an organizing project in Oakland and had been recruited to come to join, to organize. So I arrived and in truth, uh, I was already political. I helped raise money for uh, Mississippi summer and I'd been active in anti-nuclear weapons, but I remember saying, I hope my brother lets me go to the museum or something. I hope he's just not in my ear all the time about politics because he was unrelentingly a terrific organizer and he still lives uh, in Chicago and he's a wonderful organizer. Um, but that agenda went by the wayside immediately. I arrived at JOIN at that point. JOIN stood for Jobs or Income Now. It had moved from an office down near a job center in the Loop to Uptown on North Sheridan. And it was the ghetto. It was a poor people's neighborhood bordered by Wilson Avenue. And it was slated for immediate urban renewal, poor people removal. Um, the day I arrived, people from JOIN, this coalition of student organizers, some of who had been in Mississippi, uh, some who had been recruited from colleges, uh, with Southern whites, who at the time, everybody was comfortable calling uh, them hillbillies. And that's no longer how we refer to people from the South. But Blacks, hillbillies, uh, Native Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, and a bunch of us had all gone down to the loop for a nuclear uh, disarmament demonstration. And my, by then, I was going to Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon, it was one of the premier it was the first conservatory program for professional theater that had an academic standing, so that's where I was coming from. And um, I remember the dialogues with Rennie Davis, particularly one of the joint organizers, about come and uh, organize a theater around our issues. And um, I remember one of my initial questions was, but this revolution we're talking about, does it have to be violent? Because at the time, given what I was coming out of going to Quaker camps and the issue of violence and nonviolence was on my mind. And that reminds me of a story about Peggy, who was originally from Oklahoma, um, had a Klan grandfather, and her father was pro Ku Klux Klan. Her mother was not. Um, but she had migrated uh, to Chicago, uh, stopped in Michigan, back to Chicago, and was married to a man named Terry. And he had um, Old Left and um, Communist Party links. But she joined CORE. And it was a turning point. When she talked about her own turning points, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott had really changed her mind. And one of the things she said, 
was, um, you know, in the South, if you're Southern and white, you don't have much that makes you feel better than anybody else. But, but this slight thing about race gave uh, people like her a sense that they were just a little better than something. And the bus boycott changed her. She saw people being beaten and it changed her. She arrives to Chicago. She starts to understand that poor whites are discriminated against. Her husband, who has a lefty background, invites a, a black man over for dinner. And she talked about that being the first incident where a black person had been treated in a humane, respectful, way and a friendship was right there. So I'm just talking about the tiny things that that change us. Um, so, and one of the stories that I like uh, about Peggy, so I asked Reddy Davis, does it have to be violent? Those questions that people ask make all the difference in the world. Peggy organizing and going out to talk to other people in Uptown. There's a story of her at one point, she's at a, a couple who are from an immigrant background and um, the wife has a favorite teapot. And she's anxious about, does the revolution mean I have to give up my favorite teapot? <laughs> and Peggy's answer was, no, this isn't about what you have to give up. It's about all of us having dignity and respect. So that's just a story that's out there in writing. Uh, Peggy had a gift to talk to people about their concerns and where they were at in the moment. And um, whilst I don't remember her as one of the big or orators of the organization, she was quiet, respectful, eloquent, had a sense of humor, and deeply respected by all of us. Um, I came back, so I'm there in May. I come back, I've decided to leave school, that this place is, is a snake pit. It's, it's, it's people obsessed with their own anxiety and stuff. It was not attractive to me. And what I had seen in Chicago of real people struggling about real issues and their lives and the passion they had, it, it deeply appealed to me. And I decide to go and I decide to create uh, a theater on their behalf. I arrive in, uh, I think it's June 1966, but I arrive when the Cicero demonstrations, Martin Luther King, um, has come and is, has organized the Cicero demonstrations. And we take a contingent of Southern whites, blacks, uh, Latinos, the whole, our whole gang. And we're in these demonstrations where, I mean, I remember coming back to the office and I've just arrived and um, people have bloody feet because there are racists who were throwing cherry bombs at the demonstration. Um, so, uh, also at the same time there was um, a housing and a rent strike going on and Gutman, who was one of the famous landlords, slumlords, and I learned the new vocabulary of slumlording and what it meant. And one of the most successful demonstrations we did was to go to Gutman's suburban house and embarrass him in front of his neighbors and to educate his neighbors that this man is a slumlord. Sort of what should all happen to Jared <laughs> um, at the moment. Um, one of the gifts that I remember, and I think it's a Jose Marti but, phrase, but it's one that has stayed with me always, is Teach what you know, learn what you don't know. I may be paraphrasing, so I apologize. But that core belief 
is, I would say, a base of my politics that just landed in that time. And so I set to work to create and share the professional skills and the discipline of theater that I'd been learning in a very uh, rigorous manner uh, and use it in this new situation. Uh, Join was organizing around several big issues of housing and slumlords, uh, welfare rights, police brutality, and urban renewal. Those were the big ones. And different organizers would be on different committees. Um, um, I would say, from my own experience, I came primed uh, beginning to sort of wonder about what kind of theater I wanted to make in the world. My brother had sent me the Tulane Drama Review, an article about the Free Southern Theater, an article by Ronnie Davis about the San Francisco Mime Troupe, and an article by uh, Luis Valdez about Teatro Campesino. So the idea of creating plays that are at the service of, or a tool for organizing, had begun to ferment but it grew. Um, that summer, as you know, uh, this is also the time of the War on Poverty and LBJ uh, and all of these programs that tended to be Band-Aid uh, solutions instead of fundamental change, and they tended to be top-down. And that's one of the big political through lines uh, of join and things that came after. The idea that people participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And I would say that's a gift I got early about the politics um, that I was going to commit to. Um, so one of the early war and poverty programs was something called Upcast. And interestingly, Tom Mosier, who later, who was at join and later shows up as a COINTELPRO operative. And he was the, I, I'm most aware of, he later comes to California and is instrumental in the Panther murders that took place in Palo Alto. But Tom Mosier was in, joined. And of course, we had no idea. And I still, I honestly, Periodically, when we all get to have gotten together over the 50 years, 40 years, whatever it is, um, it's like, who was he then? I don't know. He was a crazy guy. He was charismatic. He uh, was influential. And he was a roommate with my brother in that very first few months. Uh, but Tom, well, I remember, he was one of the people who suggested that I and a couple of other people from JOIN go into try and get jobs within UPCAST, this War and Poverty program, and to use it as a place to make contacts and find people that might make theater. In the course of the UPCAST program that summer, we're working on plays, we do children's plays, we're working on the play uh, Dark of the Moon, um, a play I think written in the 30s or 40s, but, but with an Afro-American and white cast, again, coalition of people doing theater together. And there's a strike because it's war on poverty and they haven't cut people's checks. And again, Tom Mosier's in there, kind of fermenting all of us to go on strike. And that's why I asked you that David Puckett, because David Puckett was in Upcast with me. Um, so the um, the main people that I got close with around the theater are a woman named Little Dubby Thurman, who is exactly my age, uh, an Afro-American welfare mother with three children already, and her husband's in Vietnam. And her aunt, Big Dubby Coleman, and um, we were all in the group together, and David Puckett, and so later, this feeds into making Join's Theater. Uh, the main issues we were creating plays about were common, the common face of poverty. That poverty comes in all colors and it crosses the racial lines. 
that um, housing means, uh, and what the government's got in mind is poor people removal. That's what uh, urban renewal's about. And welfare rights. So the theater created entertaining, short plays to teach, to inspire, to get people in for the evening, and then a discussion of the issues. And it was really successful. Um, we always would sing at the meetings, um, but that idea of making a lot of events that people want to come and be part of and uh, exposes them to some new ideas was, was what we were all about. Uh, the, the, car the plays were, when I looked back, um, they were I Spy for Welfare, Dr. Joint It, uh, Miss Do Goody, the social worker, again, the patronization of the government solutions versus people deciding what they need. One of the big phrases in this time of SDS is let the people decide. Um, the fight for a playground, uh, and if, when I look at these pictures, I mean, we're talking about just rubble heaps where the children were playing. And so we were out to get some green grass and a swing. Um, police brutality, and then it was, it was interesting to look back. We began to talk about the class nature of the draft, who was going to Vietnam. So you begin to talk about Vietnam and imperialism and the war our government was fighting, while people at home were suffering and poor, and how it, how it was very class driven. Um, the, um, we took our plays to around the city, other welfare organizations. We took it to Missouri, we took it to Washington, D.C. One of my favorite memories, we'd gone to Washington, D.C. for a conference. We were performing, Little Dubby, Big Dubby, some of the others were all in Arlington Cemetery to go see Arlington Cemetery. And walking alone among the graves is Robert McNamara. And I have a picture of this that I took. So I'm not in the picture because I took it. But little Dubby, whose husband is in Vietnam, walking up to Robert McNamara and we surround him because he was there without Secret Service, honestly. Um, and he's he's uh, reverent, I would say. He's quietly walking, and we surround him <laughs> and talk to him. Um, Peggy's main job within JOIN was, she was the editor of the firing line. The importance of newspaper, the importance of a theater, the importance of the creative ways that move people, the creative ways we get to people's minds and hearts uh, is something that really stands out for me. Uh, and Peggy was the editor of the paper. My brother Michael worked on it. It was called The Firing Line, taking, taken from the song, Keep on the Front, Firing Line. Every week she had a column about welfare rights. So I want to quickly just talk about her work um, and the welfare rights. That's coming in. Am I okay on time? Am yeah. Um, a few, few more okay. minutes and then we can. Okay. Um, one of the things that made Alinsky style, uh, made join different from the Alinsky style of organizing at the time, um, was the address of poor people's immediate needs with the explicit effort to address racism. Not everybody was doing that. And to do it in the heart of a southern white uh, Chicago is one of the port cities that southern whites were moving to, to look for jobs. So to do this work in that context is pretty interesting when you look back. Peggy's own journey from the bus boycotts to uh, the relationship with her husband and her being rooted in core before she came to join 
the experience rooted to the ideas of um, once class unity is destroyed, after union busting, after gerrymandering, all the efforts to wedge it, to wedge in between people's hearts and minds of the poor that somehow they're better, somehow they're a little better than black people, that, that Peggy's life was showing her over and over, we are the same. We have to count on each other, we have to rely on each other. That's what it comes down to, what we have. My own aha moment, so Peggy's aha moments that brought her to join, and each person's got their own little trajectory. My own aha, I'm doing this work during the summer. I'm starting this theater. I'm 19 years old, uh, and I have never been arrested. And um, I'm at the office on a very precipitous night. Two weeks previously, we had organized and it was mainly organized by the good fellows, which was the young men that people were working with, it was an, um, a very big march for Uptown. Over 200 people marching against the police department, which was notorious. And Chicago's notorious. And I've spent too many times in, in uh, Chicago police station. But we had held this very successful march, primar again, primarily of poor whites. Now, earlier in the summer, we had gone to the south side, and we'd all come to a very militant black organization's police brutality march. And I remember it being kind of, you know, uh, I think I remember it kind of being scary and a little alienating. And, and I remember one guy in a cape. Um, so it, it's a period of, of the militancy is growing and the rhetoric is growing. And it's serious stuff we're all talking about. So that's happening all around the city, but it's happening also in this white neighborhood. And it's threatening. And two weeks later, guess what happens? The police, someone, had planted amphetamines, barbiturates, needles, syringes, all sorts of things, little envelopes, little pills, and they planned a bus on join, and also not people run by a Presbyterian minister in the neighborhood doing some good social work. And um, the mistake the police made was it was planned on a night that we were having a meeting for organizing, and it was such a nice evening, everybody decides to go out block organizing, which meant you kind of all go together, and then you disperse, and you go to different houses, and you knock on the door, and you talk about what's going on in your life, this is who join is, come out and join us, and, and that was sort of what we would do uh, a lot during the day and the evenings, and this was a lovely evening, and the, many of the organization had gone out to do that. I stayed behind at the office because I was expecting a friend of my brother's to come. And a guy from Northwestern who was hot for my roommate shows up. So he has nothing to do with joint. He's a law student. He gets swept up in this. There's a knock on the door. I open it. 20 to 30 police come in, submachine guns, crowbars. They tear the office apart. They rip the walls, they throw the Mimeo machine, they put me and this guy Mickey in chairs, and they proceed to keep us in the front of the office and they proceed to find things. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, I've never seen any of these things. I have never even smoked marijuana at the time. And suddenly there is this destruction and then there's arrest. 
and Richie Rothstein, who had signed the lease on join, showed up because by then people had gathered and were outside. Richie also got arrested because he held the lease. But I was the person from Join who mistakenly <laughs> is in the office that night. And I got sent the whole night to three different jails. So they were trying to have them not be able to find me to bail me out. And it was a traumatic event in my life. It was clearly a political bust for what we've been doing and doing well. And there was also a personal experience that just suddenly this police brutality and police lying and police trying to put me, the, the courtroom experience of them trying to put me in jail for nothing I had ever done was a big aha. It suddenly, it wasn't other people. It was my own experience of how deep this goes. And um, the bust is a whole other star story, but one thing I, I want to bring up, because I think we'll come back to it, there were, people were working on different issues. So you had the good fellows and the police brutality, and primarily the working with um, young men. The young men had girlfriends, but the core of what they were doing was the lack of jobs, the draft, and, and really the strength of the organization was men. Within the organization of Join, you also had an incredibly strong core of welfare mothers and female leadership that came around those issues. And Peggy Terry, Little Dubby, Big Dubby, Virginia Bowers, Mary Hockenberry, um, I'm leaving out a few people, but they were instrumental in starting a national welfare rights organization that eventually had 20,000 members. So people were organizing around different issues. Now I just want to tell one quick side because I remember within the organizers and the, the student organizers there was a debate. Juba Boykin was seen as one of the leaders of the Goodfellows, Southern white guy, high boys and well. Um, Juba was going with Candy Hockenberry. Uh, Mary Hockenberry was a welfare mom and this was one of her kids. And they were a couple and Candy worked with me in the theater and she's in a lot of the pictures. And so did Juba, but they were a couple. And Diane Fager, one of the student organizers, was hanging out a lot with Candy, so was I because of the theater. But a lot of issues about birth control and Junebug's control <laughs> over candy started to come up. I mean, what happens in our homes and in our bedrooms, we know has impact. But, but my point is, that it, the, there was a discussion among the organizers that Junebug was more important and to lay off candy. And when I think back, of course that's changed. It changed within the Panthers, it changed in all our organizations about where women are. I mean, we just, my husband and I just saw Julius Caesar last night. And, you know, a woman is playing Mark Antony. And so life has changed, but this divide, and certainly with, I call him Cheeto, but the attack on women that's going on among all the other attacks is, if you're a woman, you really feel it. But I'm just, this was one of our little mistakes at the time. Because no one is more important than another, but you do make those strategic decisions at the moment. So I'll leave it at that. She also ran for vice president of the United States. Eldridge Cleaver. So that's another area you might want to look at too. She was really involved in that. And she also helped 
Dr. King and organizing the Resurrection City in Washington. So she was uh, she worked March on Washington. Yeah. So she was involved in a lot of other things too. She's quite an amazing person. So we've, we've started to get a little bit into the lessons from today, and Ms. Mature, I'm wondering if you would speak next, if that's all right, and then and then Jake come back to a little more of the history. Okay. Um, I'll do that. So how's everybody? Good. Yeah, good. Everybody all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, first of all, let me give a big shout out to Dr. Williams, James, Hi, Melody, and you, Colleen, for being a part of this panel. Uh, I am here because I'm a bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> and um, real quickly, I, I met Hi and James last year in Philadelphia, and Dr. Williams, last year in Philadelphia. They were showing the film about the original Rainbow Coalition. James and Amy brought their book, Hillbilly Nationalist. And um, it was the week after, uh, a week but after or before or something, Dr. King's birthday, there was a major Black Radical Tradition Conference at Temple University. All those things going on in the month of January, and then this film. And the iconic picture of the press conference announcing the formation of the original Rainbow Coalition. And I just had this moment that I remembered back in 2012, a friend of mine, Ajamu Baraka, who was here at the conference today, who ran for vice president on the Green Party ticket last year. He sent us in 2012 a picture of that iconic moment. And all of these things were coming together with me. And I said, aha, we need to do something like this. Where are these people? You know, can we find them? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I began to very nicely pester James and Hyde with phone calls and text messages and emails saying, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this at the left form? Can we put this on the road, et cetera? And you know, um, they were very gracious and kind and liked the idea. Even though they never met me before, they didn't know who I was. I could be any crazy person. You know, but they liked the idea, so here we are. So I want to thank them for being a part of this panel, and thank you all for coming. Um, yay. <laughs> but real quickly, I just want to say some things. One of the reasons why I was so insistent about this kind of panel, because I wanted this to be uh, done in a way that focuses on young people in today's political environment, because there are things that we can learn from the original Rainbow Coalition, the Black Panther Party, uh, the Young Lords, other similar organizations, white lightning, et cetera, that can be used today, particularly in the issue, uh, excuse me, in the era of a Trump presidency. So this really, I hope, will resonate for young people in this room. And by young, I mean those under the age of 30, right? What can, what can we do to make this happen again? How can we better our organizing? How can we you know, invite Hi and James and Melody and other people to our communities, to our faith institutions, to our communities, to have these conversations. And how can we do this kind of organizing on a regular basis? Um, this, this history is our history. This is an organic part of our, our lives for many of us. And we can do this now and do it better because we have the technology of social media and other things. Um, so how can we build this multiracial multi-generational, inclusive of all gender coalitions to organize and fight back, not only against the right-wing reactionaries, but also the liberal reactionaries as well. How do we organize and politically educate ourselves about these many burning issues of our time? What are the lessons to be learned? How can, how can we improve on these things? What are the lessons to be learned? from people like Richard Aoki, who was a Japanese member of the Black Panther Party. What can we learn from Ed Nakawakazi, who was a Japanese member of SNCC, and he lives in Philadelphia, so I'm gonna go I'll find his house and introduce myself one day. Um, what can we learn from the radical feminists of the civil rights movement, who went on to found the domestic violence shelters, the 24-hour hotlines, the rape crisis centers, what can we learn from all these experiences today, right? Um, what can we learn from people like uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, 
two transgender women who organized here in New York City. We know about Janet Mock and Laverne Cox. But what about Syria Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson coming out against the Vietnam War? What about Sylvia Rivera organizing and advocating for Puerto Rican independence back in the 60s? Right? And their role in Stonewall, and so on and so forth. Um, what can we also learn about the young people who participated in the Occupy movement? Now, I heard a lot of, you know, kind of, hey, about Occupy. But I always saw Occupy movement as a great victory because there were things that Occupy did that was not unique to just that time period. Occupy movement was the spiritual and political grandchild of, of the Poor People's Campaign in Resurrection City on the National Mall in D.C. As a matter of fact, uh, Occupy Wall Street lasted about five or six months longer than Resurrection City. Resurrection City lasted about five or six weeks and do in part to a lot of crazy politics, but also it rained and it was messy and all that. But these are the things we need to be learning and sharing, uh, particularly with young people. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Peggy Terry, because what uh, Melly just mentioned about Peggy Terry and welfare rights, uh, 2016 was not only the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party, it was also the 50th anniversary of the National Welfare Rights Organization that also played a key role in pushing Dr. King to come out against the Vietnam War. But organization of welfare mothers, you know, people don't usually think about poor people and welfare mothers and, and people who, you know, live from the underground economy, if you know what I mean, uh, can be organizers, can be public intellectuals and have these kind of ideas about justice and what justice should look like. So um, this is how this panel came about. Um, I am very, very thankful to be a part of this panel. I look forward to working with each of you all in the future. And if I get your phone number, you will hear from me soon. <laughs> all right? So I just want to say thanks to um, all of the panelists. Thanks to Colleen. Thanks for all of you for coming. And I hope that you will um, take this information to your respective organizations, share it with young people, right? Uh, share with people that you know, faith institutions, etc. Let's continue these conversations. Let's bring Hi and James and Melody, Melody and uh, Dr. Williams and other people. We have Sharon, right, Sharon? And Dr. Dan, Dan from the October 4th organization. And Gil. Gil and Chip. Yeah, Brother Chip there. You know, let's invite you to these uh, kind of events and really deepen this understanding of the history. So I just want to again say thank you all very, very much for coming. I know it's late in the day on a Sunday. But um, let's stay in contact. I sent that sign-in sheet around. Where are they? Because I want to make sure that Hi and James get that so we can all stay in touch. And hopefully we can do this again in the very, very near future. So thank you all. God bless you. All power to the people. All power to the people. I'm just going to take about five minutes just to wrap a few things up. My name is James Tracy. I've, I had the honor of co-authoring Hillbilly Nationalists with my good friend Amy Sani, and we were also honored to have the introduction written by my hero over there, Roxanne Dunbar Artiz. I'm going to uh, just share a little bit about what I what I learned by getting to know Peggy Terry and Bob Lee. I got to know Peggy Terry after she was dead. Her, uh, her daughter invited us into their home where Peggy had left behind an archive. Peggy Terry had had a fifth grade education and her archive, her personal archive, and her notes and her analysis that she left behind for people uh, was the envy of a librarian or professional archivist. Right? And Amy is actually a professional librarian and an archivist. Because this is better than most of the people I work around, right? So the first lesson about Peggy Terry is that everybody can engage intellectually. Whether, you're, you're, uh, whether your work is actually in a university or in a community, or even better, both, right? Uh, you know, intelligence and analysis isn't something that just happens here in these settings, right? It happens in the, key, the community. When people with jobs or income now, community union showed up in Uptown, 
uh, they were doing something that was very, very advanced because black leaders had been asking white activists to organize their own, right, for quite a long time. When the Economic Research and Action Project was created, which was sent, sent folks in as, uh, into communities to do the organizing, students, uh, the Chicago kids were the only ones that actually went to a white neighborhood to do that, right? They were actually listening. And it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't just Stokely Carmichael saying, you know, get on out of the South, right? This uh, organize your own mandate, ask, demand, was gone back to Ella Baker. Right, the, um, Bayard Rustin had made the same ask. Stokely Carmichael was like, "Okay, come on, it's it's time, you know, get on out there." Um, so that, you know, so it was moving on to Bob Lee. But the first thing Bob Lee, I interviewed him four times, and I've had like at least thirty phone calls with him because once you once you were friends with Bob Lee, you were friends. Never met him in, in the flesh, but he always would call up, "Hey, how's your family? How's your mom?" First thing he told me was like, first thing you need to know is that the Rainbow Coalition was code word for class struggle, right? Because our people weren't ready to be in a, in a racial organization at that time, but we wanted to prepare them for that, right? So it wasn't just uh, a static thing that everybody would, you know, this would, this would be the one model for all of politics for the future, but this was trying to meet, meet people where they were at, listening. Uh, and analyzing and trying to figure out what organizational forms and what coalitional forms could actually could actually move people, right? And get, and provide people the opportunity to learn from one another, to break bread with one with one, one another, and visit each other's neighborhoods, and find out what they had in common. But also what the, it, but also learn how to stand up for each other, right? To stand up for each other in a solidarity. Um, the other thing I learned from 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 Bob that I think would surprise a lot of people is that he wasn't he wasn't dogmatic. He was very had like he'd studied ideology and organizing methods, and he took the best from the best and he left the rest. Uh, so after the Rainbow Coalition and after uh, and Hansel's uh, death, he actually studied with Solovinsky, because Solovinsky was very envious of the original Rainbow Coalition's ability to address race. And if you read Saul Alinsky, um, and I really hope that people, it's actually, a, a, a reading Saul Alinsky for, in his own words is actually complicates a lot of the ways that we understand it, because he was painfully aware at that point that, uh, that you know, just having a populist message wasn't working and that he actually had to address race. Um, and he brought in he brought in Bob Lee, and they had conversations, and they had arguments, and they did work uh, work together. And uh, and what what Bob explained to me was like, well, Alinsky got you know his mama got us like two thirds of the way, right? He could reach the people, he could get them going for justice. He was try and he was trying to come up with with an American radicalism that would work for us. <laughs> But he was afraid of having those real conversations until it was too late, right? So, um, and the real difference between, say, reformist organizing, even the best reformist organizing, and radical organizing, they're very similar, right? You have to go knock on doors, and you have to ask people what they want to do, and things like that. But the radical organizers say, okay, well, what's, what's the real causes of these problems? Who's causing them? Don't blame your neighbor, right? Don't you know, don't don't blame immigrants, don't blame new people, don't blame black people, but fight fight the real uh, fight the real enemy. So those are some of the lessons. Amy and I wrote this wrote Hillbilly Nationals because we were both organizers and we felt that once we found out about these histories that we had to that they had clues, right? And I do think that the worst thing that anybody could do is try to mechanically um, copy something from the past, right? Especially the sixties and the seventies, right? But the fact that we all have the responsibility to do real organizing, right, uh, to do, and that white people need to reach white people, black people need to reach black people, brown people need to reach brown people, and we have those responsibilities to organize our own, but we have the greater responsibility to prepare people to work with one another. So um, I'm, you've heard of you, you've heard from us for the past hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we would love to hear from you. I'll turn this back over to, to uh, Colleen. It's 
really great to have everybody here. It's wonderful to have other other people that I friends that I got to know from uh, doing interviews. And um, let's hear what y'all have to say. So let's figure out how to defeat the alt right in the next forty minutes. <laughs> questions and not uh, soliloquies from, from the audience, and um, particularly questions that engages the panelists with each other and sort of drawing out some of the, the lessons and histories and, and places where you'd like to know more. Uh, yeah, I'll avoid soliloquy. I've had the experience of working in a multinational, uh, you know, multicolor framework here in New York. It's now 30 years ago. Uh, with tenants in buildings that were taken over by the city of New York for back taxes. And we, were, we did pretty well on the level of fighting city government. We did not get to <coughs> self-criticism and criticism of people I worked with. We did not deal well with racism in an overt way. And so my question is, uh, we, nonetheless, we, we did do good work together. Uh, people supported each other in each other's neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods were principally black. One neighborhood was principally white. Other neighborhoods were principally Latino. We came together around the common issue, which is that we wanted to get decent housing and keep the city from shoveling it back out to private speculators. Uh, but we didn't quite figure out, beyond just doing practice together, how to do, how to confront Racism, and of course there was racism under the surface. Uh, it didn't come out very obviously in our work. But I'm just curious, just from what I'm telling you, if you could somehow suggest what we might have done a little bit better in terms of confronting that sort of hidden, well, hidden in, in plain sight issue of, uh, of racism among uh, work. They were mostly poor and, uh, and poor working class folks that were in, the, in these buildings. One of the things that I would say is, I don't know how it worked within your organization, but we figured out real quick, and we've had some discussions about this over the weekend, is that you kind of have to meet people where they are. I mean, some people may, uh, may be right on with trying to eliminate racism. Uh, some people may be, um, You know, like Hispanics, American Indians, but they have a problem with blacks. So you have to, not everybody's going to, you know, think the same. They're going to have different ideologies. And I'm thinking about Southern, you know, Southern people uh, in particular, you know, who uh, have intermingled race, you know, raised uh, in black and white relationships, but still, um, when it comes right down to it, still determined racism, and still have racism. So I think that's something we have to, we have to confront all the time. Uh, one of the things we had to do with the, with the young patriots, and what we were doing as young you know, hillbillies in Chicago, we had to demonize racism we had to make it evil to where we had to do something about it. Because every time that we looked at racism, we, we wouldn't necessarily look at it intellectually because we weren't very intellectual, but we had to look at it on the level that you know, we could, people could understand. Uh, like Southern people, we, you know, we, we wore a Confederate flag, you know, which is uh, people thought were was really strange, and and uh, but we would wear the flag, a racist emblem, as a way of fighting racism, uh, because we would have the flag and also have maybe a free Huey button or you know some third world country heroes on there or whatever, and that would give us an opportunity to go in and talk to people about what this flag actually represented, you know. 
professionals, we we talk to people and they would say, I'm not racist, but you know, there's always a but, you know. And anytime you have that word but, there is racism. So that's one of the you know one of the areas we would talk about, and uh, we would we would talk to people about that. We talk to people about their heritage, uh, but we would also talk about their needs in terms of we were very much into survival programs at that point. You know, free health clinics, uh, breakfast for children programs, uh, welfare programs. And therefore we could get people services, but at the same time as we were getting them services, we were educating them. You know, we were turning them, we were changing them. And so that's what we were about because we were also doing it to ourselves at the same time. We didn't consider ourselves to be an expert uh, because we were raised in that white supremacy, that you know, uh, uh, environment. So we had to change ourselves and, and actually demonize racism and classism. And we had to think of that as something just very, very evil. You know, it's like I think we had to cast out the demon and you know the and slay it basically. Uh, so that was the only way that we could actually deal with, you know, with them. But everybody was on a, a different level, so we had to try to reach them on a different level with their beliefs and their behavior. But that's that's the only explanation that I have for it that we, that we worked on. Well, to, to echo High's point, um, most of the people in many of these organizations, and I'm. I don't want to stereotype your folks that I don't know, them. but generally speaking, you can safely generalize, a lot of people are just misinformed and uneducated. Uh, and the ways in which you get around that, it was highly alluded to some of this, is, again, not really written well, looking back at some of the people, the groups that I studied, people had PE classes, uh, what they call political education classes, where you can meet people where they are. And then, so you can take the Black Panther Party, for example, it wouldn't be just Panthers, it would be just a community meeting. And as they're having these free breakfast programs or free clinics and so forth, these exchanges happen in those spaces too. So you get people to transcend race, but you have to you have to do some real self-criticism and also make some hard decisions. Some of these people you talk about, some of them got to be purged out of your organization. You have to make some real hard decisions. Um, if you can't look, if you can't unite for the greater good, these people are going to bring everyone down. Uh, I mean, so you have to make some real tough decisions. Uh, and so those PE classes are more practical ways of doing it. Now, deciding what you read and what you study and how and who teaches it, I mean, that's, that's arbitrary in a number of ways. But the baseline is uh, meeting everyone where they are so you can have a shared general understanding of why you're doing what you're doing and why this benefits everyone and you can transcend those differences. Because those those issues of housing is not just a black issue, white issue, Latin. Everyone wants decent housing. So how do you get past that? And when you can transcend those, get folks in these in these PE classes to rethink the way in which they approach the individualistic. If everyone's coming to this to these meetings or to this program or to the organization for individual goals, and you can get folks to, to actually understand and value the collective. And then you can realize, they will realize as well, and be changed in other ways to demonstrate that divide and conquer tactics are old and real. And ways in which you as an individual are trying to get something in, in, in terms of um, out of this particular tenant program that you have, um, if you only look at it individually, someone's being left out. And if everyone looks at it that way, eventually that person will be left out. So there's all these real pragmatic ways and practical ways of re-educating people, so to speak. Uh, and I use the word misinformation or uninformed, I should say, instead of uneducated, and people get offended when you say they don't know something, they are educated. And so the, what the party and other groups like to do is highlight contradictions. So everyone comes to the table at different levels thinking they know something. But when you highlight the contradictions, uh, the folks tend to unite up around those contradictions uh, because they hit home personally and collectively. Take another question, that's right. Okay, cool. um, I went to a high school in Chicago in 68 and 69, uh, which was one of the few uh, integrated high schools in the city. And uh, 
the Panthers came in and pretty much organized the Black Student Union out from under its leadership in about five minutes. <laughs> and the reason that this brings, I mean, this was, this was a big event for me because what I experienced around that was uh, when we talk about white people going through transformation around, around racism, what Hampton did was very much about transforming the folks that were joining the Panthers. He himself was transformed by the Oakland Panthers around uh, uh, recognizing that, that his, his racial focus fit, you know, intersected with a class focus. And that, 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 was, that was passed along to all the people who were flocking to join the Black Panther Party in Chicago. Uh, you know, following King's assassination. And uh, what I experienced was that, they're, they're, that, that my classmates were, in fact, transformed virtually overnight from giving us a radical. We had a little radical student group that was hooked up with SDS. And, and, and uh, we were very pro-Panther. But, uh, you know, we didn't expect our classmates to just jump in and say, you know, right on, right on, because they were just newly politicized themselves. But with the influence of the Panthers, with, with the, uh, the PE that the Panthers were doing, they didn't just like come around. They became advocates for this kind of multiracial organizing. And, uh, it, you know, it was, it was, it was something that, that, you know, it was something to see that folks were really having their eyes open partly by political education, but also partly by the basic argument, which was, let's get the allies we can get. We'll find out if we can trust them, but let's get the allies that we can get. And that ran up against another tendency that was even going on in the Black Student Union, which was more so I want to acknowledge that you know a lot about this, but also encourage you to ask a question. Okay. So My I question. Appreciate, I appreciate that. I get carried away. Personal <laughs> I get, I, I salute the <laughs> I'm sorry. No, uh, <laughs> so my question is to Hi about his talking to, to, to Bobby Lee about, um, about the work that was done. Um, and the, the role of, of uh, personal transformation, uh, did that ever come up? Did you ever go over some of that? that? That whole question about people actually moving into, you know, becoming revolutionaries, but even going beyond the idea of, well, we're going to have a revolution to, you know, changing their whole way of looking at, at the folks around them. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean he was, well with, with, with Bobby, uh, Bobby Lee and others, they were always looking, Bobby was always looking at beyond, you know, beyond the revolution. I mean, what are you, what are you gonna do after the revolution? We talk about it, oh, let's go have a revolution. Okay, what does that mean? I mean. Does that mean everybody's going to be equal? Does that mean that, uh, how's it going to work? Is this a Bernie revolution? So you got to look beyond, you know, you got to look beyond it. And there's probably thousands of different ideas out there. Of it. But the only thing that, that, that stuck with, with him, and many more, is the Rainbow Coalition. Because he, was convinced that the Rainbow Coalition was the revolution. And if you get people involved in the Rainbow Coalition, uh, with, you know, with that, with that being a, the, the code word and with that being uh, that the Rainbow Coalition didn't really have any leaders in particular. There were, you know, these organizations at the time. So that's how they were picked off. Uh, every one of the organizations were, were picked off, and um, but continuing to organize something in, in like a rainbow coalition is what we're, we're doing now with some of the uh, the redneck revolt people, or you know uh, the the other Humboldt Park in Chicago, um, where all these different organizations are together, but. There's like 20 chapters, for instance, in the Redneck Revolt, um, and they're just they're they're hardcore uh, anti-fascist, you know, white supremacy. They go out and take guns and confront the Klan, but these guys are tough. And and what they're doing is they've elected a delegate, 
that they call a delegate, and if somebody's got some information, in which I did recently for them, their help, I go to that delegate and they get it around the, you know, around the organization. In other words, there's really no leadership that can be picked off. Uh, other than the delegate, but that's, you know, that's a different story, but the same thing is happening in, in parts of Humboldt, uh, part of Chicago, uh, with some organizations that are, they have contacts of people in apartment buildings, and if there's a, if there's a problem within the community, uh, they contact the people in those buildings, and they'll have a system set up that we're talking about, just being developed now that they contact these people, they contact the people in these buildings and they get them out on the street, for instance. So, that's one way of doing it. Uh, you see, because they can't take off everybody like they did, you know, Hampton and, and Fred Hampton and others. So that's just another way of organizing. But looking beyond that, we have to even look beyond that. It's bringing people together again, but we don't have an answer yet. You know, we don't have that getting rid of the Vietnam War that we had that everybody, you know, everybody got behind. Uh, we don't have those issues anymore for some reason. You know, we just don't have them other than Trump. Okay, so just to keep it quick, um, sort of how do we, how do you maintain sort of movement independence and uh, avoid sort of co-optation and sort of de-radicalization of movements, especially sort of in the era of, 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 of NGOs and found, uh, of NGO and NGOs and foundation money. Who wants that? Well, uh, first, I would, I would say that if you're at a point where you have to worry about your movement being uh, co-opted, you've built a lot, right? So it's almost a luxury to have that problem and it, it, in the first place. Uh, I believe in, in movement ecology. Uh, NGOs can provide a certain amount of stability uh, to a movement when it's in low, but we have to make sure that comrades, they go into NGOs, make sure that they have have a movement to stay accountable to. I actually work in an NGO right, uh, right now, and it's, it's, a ch it's a challenge, right? You know, it's a big, it's a really big challenge to make sure that your organization is not deployed against movements when they come up, right? It's a really good thing when movements aren't happening because we're providing basic services and some basic analysis. So it's really, I think it's about creating creating some really big big dialogue between comrades who go into NGOs and those who stay out and also creating some rotation so people don't stay forever in the NGO. It's like, hey, maybe this is your time to go be a paid professional organizer in a union or a nonprofit, get your skills up, dedicate some time to it, but then you got to pass that, pass that along. I think it's a, it, but the the number one thing that is that really starts with is stopping the finger pointing, right? Where, uh, you know, NGO people look at uh, some <coughs> will finger, finger point at the street level radicals. Ah, oh, they're too radical. That's the black bloc or whatever. They're they're foolish. We're the real organizers. We have the training, and then it goes the same way. Then like. The street level uh, organizers are like, oh, they're just sold out. And well, most people work at nonprofits and NGOs work at 80, 80 hours a week, a lot of over and self exploit, right? So it's about creating some dialogue with people that are going towards the same goal and figuring out how we uh, how we transform these things structurally instead of pointing fingers at each other. Um, can we get, I, I think, Melody, is it okay? Because I know you wanted to answer something. Yeah, I want to talk more about today, um, uh, the lessons for today. <laughs> um, I was thinking of Peggy Terry and how she um, and the Black Panthers understood at that time that fascism was, racism is fascism, fascism is racism, white supremacy, and, and that we have this rising again. So what lesson, I'm thinking right now at this moment, I've been monitoring it because it's going on right now in Portland that the fascists, all right, are having a demonstration, which they call free speech, and the Oregonian newspaper. 
were you calling them the free speech protesters instead okay. of the fascists? Mm -hmm. And the Antifa, so they're you know trying not very successfully to um, intervene. The police are taking what they call weapons away from them, so called fight stuff. Anyway, um, it's not being very effective, the Antifa. So I, how how can you take the lessons for that time today? I know you don't have all the answers, but maybe we could just brainstorm a bit about some ideas that could we might be able to intervene in destroying fascism more effectively. Then these young people, I really admire them, the Antifa. But I, that's better than nothing. No, just, but I think you know they need guidance, and there are lessons from the past that might be useful. Maybe we could all answer that with a two-sentence uh, <laughs> response to that, and then I know that there's two people in the back. Two sentences. First. <laughs> dig deep. Here we go. What? Dig, dig deep and build a um, build a real base in, in a community. I didn't hear what. No, I said I can't answer that in two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> you heard mine. Dig deep and build a real base. Well, what a, uh, I can't do it. Uh, um, one of the things that I'm, you know, that I know from just being in the South and, and being there now and talking to people is, is their understanding of fascism and what is it? You know, they don't understand and they have to be educated to the point where understand that fascism, racism is fascism. But they think of fascism, but fascism automatically comes into Hitler, you know, Nazis. So they don't understand that their way of thinking is is fascist. And once you once you relate, and I, I've done that in my family, which I talked, Lynn and I were talking about it, and and I finally have some members of my family that's understanding what I'm doing, you know, and, and and that's a good thing. I mean, it's a really good thing for me because I've been out there for so long with doing it, and then thinking that you only took it. Yeah, you're right, right, right. You know, but it's took it, it's took educating, educating, educating to get it done, and I think that's what we're going to have to do again. And and the other thing is is, is the media. They're not going to give our side of you know, what we're doing. They're going to show you know I don't know what what do they show out there. You know, let's get some fashion show on there instead of showing people dying you know, from starvation or from crisis killings and all that, but I think we have to move into different areas and, and even get our own media together. To, to, if they're not, you know, the newspapers are not going to cover us. We have to have our own system set up. And I don't see that as being organized. Like back in the days when we were in the 60s, we had the newspaper, you know, we could put out the newspaper, we didn't have the social media. But now if we can use the social media in a way of educating people to fascism, and racism, I think that's, I uh, think it's going to You're organizing all these chapters mm -hmm. around. What, what are they supposed to do? I mean, besides getting organized, are they going to deal with some, with yeah. some of these things? Too? Yeah, they deal. Uh, one, of, one of the requirements of, of say, uh, a chapter, when we organize a chapter, is that we have a seven-point program and survival program. Excuse me, is that the Redneck Revolt? No, that's no, my Young Patriots. Okay. Um, yeah, and and they have to they have to adopt survival programs, and those survival programs can be, uh, you know, uh, feeding the homeless. It can be, you know, uh, health. So we're thinking about health clinics now, or so you know, other that's... other types of programs, housing, uh, in, incarceration. But this gives us an, an opportunity to educate people. You know. I like his term, re-educate. Re-educate, yeah, re-educate there. Yeah, I like that too. But, but yeah, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Melody, I either you have the, the original question or the follow-up question. No, this is true. Yeah, I guess I um, me, I am like this is about like like 20 or so other people are in, a, in an organization in Rhode Island and we kind of like 
realized pretty quickly sort of that like we were sort of stuck in this sort of like sort of like almost like reading group sort of trap and mentality and very realized you know like that's not enough to organize people and that's not enough to like you know do things and so we do want to do things so I guess my question is sort of like how do you like what resources do you need to like do things like breakfast programs and kind of other things to serve the people in your community and like how do you get those resources like how do you get those programs started when you've kind of never done it before well I'm curious to know what you read in your reading group. You don't have this answer already. <laughs> Honestly, because um, this is how most of these groups did it in the past, right? They started as what they call PE classes, right? Reading this stuff and then putting that theory into practice, trying to figure out what you can. Actually, you have way more opportunities to do it now than they did then because of NGOs and nonprofits and so forth. Honestly, quite honestly, you do. They didn't have all those things back then. Charter schools, or they had liberation schools, they had charter schools, and all that kind of me mechanism you could use. Um, so I get this question quite often. So I, let me preface because I don't want you to think I was attacking you or, or being sarcastic or being disrespectful. No, no, I get this question a lot, especially from my students on campus. Uh, and I, I tell, I'm telling you what I tell them. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, most of these groups gave you a step-by-step -step guide on how they did these things. So. Um, it might just it's, it's, it's as small as adding some additional readings to your already reading group. Because there's a lot of how-to step guides that are that were implemented then. Like for instance, I was telling you about seven-step program. Did you reinvent this? No. This something just made up today. No, <laughs> well, these things ago. that worked 50 years ago they worked mm -hmm. now, right? And so, and so now you have a lot more mechanisms and, and opportunities and and ways of organizing your community in their own uh, self-determining self -determining ways of doing it. And so, for example, if you want to start a free clinic or a free health clinic, uh, you have almost every major, major university has a free clinic now. It didn't exist before these groups like the Young Patriots and the Panthers were doing it. So you have doctors and medical school people who have to do their residency somewhere, which is what they did. Right? And they went and recruited these folks to organize these clinics. And then they know people who know people. And you organize a network, and then you get x-ray machines and CT scanners and all that other stuff they had in the community for free. Right? And these folks and nurses get equipment, and you hook up with pharmaceutical companies. Now you can get NGOs and nonprofits to donate some of stuff. Hell, you can get professors to write grants on some of these college campuses. And get some. You have a whole array of networking opportunities to do some of this work. Now that goes back to uh, James' point earlier about keeping the control of it. Because if you, once you start having some success, then it draws the attention of people, and then the IRS comes in, people want to look at your paper trail, who, some people, you might get some haters, because hate is real. Um, <laughs> what you really doing with these profits? Um, so for instance, the Panthers, people don't know this, the Black Panther Party was a socialist-driven group, but they had an LLC. They had a corporation. Why? Because you had people in the community thinking they were raping the community of people of funds. You have Marlon Brando and every celebrity under the sun donating hundreds of thousands of dollars, and people think the parents are pocketing this money. So they have to have an LLC stack, a paper trail with bank accounts and employee ID numbers and tax ID numbers and so forth and so on. But most folks think they just, just it's just simple. The community is out here running. No, they have some legal apparatus behind it. How did they build an the LLC? They ain't attorneys. I've got an idea Talk for you. Talk to some nonprofit attorneys. And they, they built this stuff for them. Does anybody in your study group have a car? Yes. Take, um, why don't you find uh, find family members who have incarcerated family members and offer them rights? Yeah, because that's a, perfect, mm -hmm. that's a perfect way to have a conversation and build trust and rapport with folks. Don't trap them in the car and preach show them about Marxism on the first <laughs> year. But, you know, I mean, they just uh, use something simple that you already have that can be, that somebody yeah. doesn't have and offer it to them in a way that creates a conversation. And then you can say, hey, what what are the needs in your in your community that we could be helped? That sounds why I know yeah. too. And you get up highlight contradictions again. So I like, I keep coming back to this highlight contradiction. It's the way in which you get people who want to, they resist you at face value. And then you start highlighting these contradictions and and have them practicing what you wanted them to practice, as Fred Hampton would say. People people reject socialism. Then we start 
feeding kids and having health clinics and so forth. And now people practicing socialism. Now uh, when the police come and get rid of these programs, it's the people that's defending the damn program as they claim they hate socialism. But they're practicing, they even highlight the contradictions. So it's ways of overcoming some of these obstacles by using these back doors to do it. I would just say, real quickly to your question, uh, research food not bombs uh, and what they do, how they get the food. In Philadelphia, they have different groups around the city and they provide food at different progressive events. But at the same time, they do research and political education on food deserts, the, the big, the rising agribusiness and how food is grown and distributed and who makes those decisions, pesticides used on food, the whole thing about Whole Foods uh, as a chain being anti-union, just like Walmart, right? Uh, so all those things can go into uh, that. And also, in terms of work community organizing and having events, please, organize child care. Let me seriously. I just, uh, a couple things. I the teapot story really comes to mind that um, I think a lot of times in the past, people, when we were doing political work, it was we had the analysis and we were going and giving it. And I think one of the most key things about that teapot story, where Peggy assuaged that family's fears that they would lose their, their favorite teapot in the revolution, it, it was to really take people where they are at and go from there. I think also you've got the war and poverty government programs that they really stuck with the band-aid so that something James said of, of um, preparing people to work together. It's, and we have to do that, and we have to do it fast, but also this idea that, that our neighbors are not the enemy. And that's just sort of daily and what we can do in wherever we are. Uh, I think sometimes real change comes from some episode or something happens. And then if you've got the affinity group, the structure, the people ready to move, and, and clearly that's something no matter what we have to be doing. Um, one of the things Join did early on, and, I, and we weren't calling it, I don't think, PE. I remember that term from when I went to California. But, but we were, there were people that were writing pamphlets, and there were people within the organization who learned to read with the pamphlets. But they are not reading Dick and Jane. They're reading, what does urban renewal mean, and who's benefiting? So where people are at and what matters to them and making it go further to stretch the limits of how they think about it is our work. And it, it I think about the bond that Peggy Terry and the little and big dubbies, you know, white and black women working together and the bond, I mean, you can't manufacture that stuff. It, it happened because a lot was coming from their own personal journeys. But then you had a cons construct that helped them. Um, I want to quickly go back to something that you said in the back. Because something I learned um, about how do we uh, identity politics are critical. We also are also all in this together, more than now than ever. But that difficulty of organizations that are of one race not being able to talk to others. When I was in the San Francisco Nine Troop for 12 very powerful years, um, and if you don't know them, they're the oldest political theater, they are still in existence, and they have survived. <laughs> and that's not saying anything at all. But, um, Luis Valdez and Teatro Campesino came out of the mine troupe. I mean, it was an interracial group. I first saw them uh, doing civil rights in a cracker barrel. So the troupe had been integrated. And then with the political climate, people went to work in their own communities. But something that changed, that this is your point, um, we wanted to talk 
about racism in the plays. And what we were learning is uh, black and brown people, people of other races, would gather around the periphery of the crowd and the parks. My true performance, Free in the Parks, and that was literally the core where they started. But what we learned is you have, you have to see yourself reflected in order to be drawn into the experience. Yep. And so that became, you know, then we saw the posters that always just kind of pro, pro forma had to have somebody of every race, somebody. So no, um, we're actually out of time. Can we get the one, the one last question from the back though? Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, hi. Okay. So, um, I have to reformulate. I should really quickly. I think that just picking up on what you, your, our last speaker commented on about thinking about what our, our circles are today and not necess necessarily trying to replicate it, and thinking about how there is actually something that does um, nationally, and I would say um, on a continent level, like pipelines. We need to think about what pipelines do to also working class communities and cities, and how. I guess my question to the panel is, you know. So bringing in and, and working in solidarity with Native communities around these issues of uh, pipelines, so how that also fosters the anti-colonial awareness along the lines of anti-racism and anti-colonialism. So how do, you, how do you work with people who are you know, convinced that pipelines are their answer to poverty? And what way can you, I know it's about meeting them, but any suggestions around that? You know? Can I take you back on that question so you can, they can answer at the same time? Yeah. Um, the, uh, similarly for Hive, uh, what I'm dealing with is not when I try to communicate to poor white people, it, where I'm from, is not racism. Nobody wants to be racist in that. They are, we're all racist, obviously, <laughs> in a more veneer way, but not overtly. It's more that they're too prideful to say they don't want to work hard. They're willing to work hard if the job exists, but they're not willing to believe that those jobs don't exist anymore. So it's kind of with the pipeline thing. Everyone there makes their money in oil and gas, and that's how they survive. So how do you convince, how do you deal with classism in these groups of, of not poor people to rich people, but poor people to sort of poor people? Cooperation Jackson. I would say look at Cooperation Jackson's uh, We It's going to take a long time, if ever, to have a revolution. We have to have alternative economic development in the here and now. Um, not because not because we love reforms, but because we want people to stop being hostages, right? Because we're all economic hostages, and things they're doing with, with co cooperative development in, in Jackson, I think that's the clue. So check that out in Cooperation Jackson. Jackson. We're having a fundraiser tonight at 6 o'clock at Versa over there. So, uh, Jackson, and, Mississippi? Yes. Yeah. 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 Check, yeah, check out Cooperation Jackson. It definitely get down with Roxanne uh, over here about who knows a thing or two about indigenous people or organizing. And what I what I would say about that real quickly is when we talk about intersectionality, for some people that's a bad word, but it's not for me. Because what happens in Standing Rock, you look at a similar situation in Flint, in Philadelphia, and other places in terms of old pipelines in houses. Right? Yeah, New York. And, and, yeah, and New York, and people can't always afford to get new pipes because you inherited the house from grandma and now it's yours and you're pretty much living there rent free, you may have to pay taxes on it, but you can't afford to redo the pipes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And if you could, is the water that is in your house is suspect at best, look at Flint, yeah. right? And then and with that, you, ins you inherit a house from your grandmother and you're glad to have it but there's something in the walls, and your child has asthma because you can't afford to get the walls, we're gonna get the mold out. Right? So these, these kind of health issues are also issues of poverty, right? In Baltimore, when Baltimore blew up, when Freddie Ray was murdered by the Baltimore police, that neighborhood had hundreds of households who owed hundreds of dollars in their water bills. And their water got cut off. In Baltimore, if your water is cut off, DHS or whatever it's called can come in and take your children. Right? So these this is what I mean by intersectionality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.